Good morning, UCY.TV. This is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Vision radio show. So uh, today is Wednesday, and it's October 5th, 2016. It's 8 a.m. in the morning Pacific Standard Time. Uh, so we really appreciate you joining us. Wednesdays is our interview day, and I wanted to share with you today, we have a pretty exciting guest that very few people get to hear from. Right before the radio show, she actually unloaded some pretty interesting information that I am, my mouth is, my jaw is still on the floor. Uh, let me introduce to you first Hope Castor. She is in Washington. She contacted me. She's a listener of our show. She is a truth nuker, and I am refusing to call ourselves an anti-nukers because that's a negative connotation. So I totally am moving my conversation to be calling ourselves truth nukers because the truth is nuclear is a failed experiment and completely deadly. So, uh, Hope, uh, I want to welcome you to the show. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you, Lonnie. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm a big fan of your show. I thought your um, interview with Carl Grossman was brilliant. He is one of my favorite people, and Me I am too. just so impressed with the work you're doing. You know, I actually I bought three of his right books away. so that I, can, I bought three of his books so I can give two of them away to some of our listeners in case anybody wants one. But uh, first, let me introduce you. This is kind of a big plus for me. This is why I really liked you, is that you're a juggler, and a lot of people know you as Bobby Galileo. So welcome to right. the show, Bobby Galileo. I'm thrilled because I, too, am a juggler. <laughs> so Isn't I love that cool? part of my life. What are the odds of two women who actually can pass clubs talking to each other? I, I, mean, I just love this. I love this. And when I started to juggle, dinosaurs were ruling the earth. No women were juggling. And I was stepping way outside the box in trying to make a living. And I did an anti-nuke show. I did an anti-racist, anti-sexist show. And I made money. I made my living at it after terminal cancer. I'm a five-time terminal cancer survivor twice that cancer was terminal and i didn't have nice cancer where you fly all over the world and go for long hikes i had ugly vicious where you vomit all day over a toilet and can barely pay the eighty dollars rent on your room okay i mean it was the most miserable experience you can imagine except becoming a targeted individual which might even be worse than terminal cancer what they have done to me in many ways because it's real people working for big nuclear corporations, big behemoth major corporations that own studios, that own radio stations, that have targeted me, went after me. It is sick. And okay, what so look, I, did, I, want, I want to bring you back down to this because I want to share with our listeners. Uh, for anybody who's living in Oregon or in we the western state of Oregon or in Eugene okay. or anywhere up, I w about fell off my chair. Hope was telling me that she testified a company called, and on the on, on the line, I looked it up before the show. It was called ATI. It's right here in Albany, Oregon. Right. Well, share a little bit of your story. How did you get engage and how did you become a targeted individual by the nuclear industry go back and share with us a little bit of what happened to you and how you started speaking out and then what happened in the off pie well i'm irish and i'm french and i was born on a homestead uh, right outside mount shasta and we are native american a quarter and even though i look like a white girl I was adopted into the last of the tribe who was dying out then uh, from Mount Shasta. And they knew uh, my grandfather, who was a Native American. They knew my grandmother, who was a Native American. She was a Stony Indian from Canada, First Nation. Yay! And I was taught on my grandmother's milk how to be an environmentalist. Our planet is our mother. We love this place. We love our children. And this is one of the things that has helped me survive years of abuse, of tragedy, of stalking, of terrorism. And when I first got cancer, nobody knew the kind of cancers I had, Lonnie. They, uh, people were stunned. I had Graves' disease, and I had all three types of thyroid cancer at 20 years old. Wow. And Where, did you grow up in Mount, Where did you grow up, Mount Shasta? Well, they had moved. They were. Um, my family was actually being harassed by the government. And they were frightened. My grandfather was shot in the back for our homestead. Wow. Um, you have to understand, 
when I say we're Native American, I mean he, he was a Native American rights activist way before it was cool. And um, uh, so they moved, and they were frightened for me. And I never understood this until years and years later. And why it's still a really interesting question. But we moved up into northern uh, Oregon. And one day my parents went swimming right downstream from Hanford. I was eight years old. I got sick that night. Everybody thought I was going to die. Nobody knew it was cancer for 12 years. How long did when I was you... Finally, how, so let me take you back to that. You moved how far right. from Hanford? We, I, we, we were living about 160 miles from Hanford, but we went swimming there one day. Earlier that day, a strange man had pushed me off a dam. I'd taken a terrible fall. I'd fallen maybe 40 feet. And uh, I was all right, but I had lost a lot of the skin. I had been skinned all over my body. I went into the water, and the government has always denied that there was radiation in the Columbia River. That is a lie. There is radiation in the Columbia River. I don't believe I had airborne emitters. I might have, but I doubt it. But either the trauma of the accident happening to me that day or uh, the loss of blood, whatever it was, what well, happened to me is I got that, sick immediately. If, if your blood touched right. that radiation, right. you know, our skin's a great protector, but that's what I tell my grandchildren. Don't put the rain in your eyes or in your ear, in your mouth. Don't don't drink raindrops anymore. Right. But that luxury right. is gone. But that's exactly right, Lonnie. That's exactly right. Uh, we are being radiated every day from Fukushima. And um, long before I had cancer, um, knew I had cancer. I had cancer the whole time, but I didn't know it. Um, I became an anti, uh, excuse me, not an anti-nuker, a nuker truther, <laughs> because that's what we are. We are out in big behemoth industries that made a whole lot of money from Trinity on with secret military industrial complex money. They have bought radio stations. I've always said what happened to me is really MK Ultra. It's MK Ultra went to Hollywood and bought some some pretend rock bands. Okay, <laughs> I mean really, that's what it is. It's um, and it's deadly and it's horrible. Uh, a famous woman and I can't remember her name. She's a famous Irish activist who who has really done some great work on Chernobyl. One of the things she said, the most deadly thing that came out of Chernobyl wasn't the, the wasn't the radiation. It was the lies. Right. Millions of people have died from Chernobyl. Chernobyl is a small accident compared to Fukushima. Fukushima right. is the biggie. This, we are up against it now. We are in it now. I don't care who you are. If you're on the West Coast right now, you are in it. If you're in the South of America, and I've always said L.A. is going to be hit worse than Washington State, because, because of the jet stream, they're getting double-dosed every day. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, Ronnie, um, when I went swimming in that river, I was only six years, eight, excuse me, eight years old. Nobody knew what was wrong with me. Wow. Later, years later, they were able to look back and say, my God, you got radiation sickness. Your teeth all rotted. You got multiple abscess teeth, 17 root canals later. Uh, wow. My teeth all, all, all rotted. My hair all fell out. And I bonded progressively for years. Nobody understood. We know now. We know these children are going to get sick from this, Lonnie. What and, year was and so this I became, you went swimming, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I went swimming approximately in 1964. So that was before the government they moved said, the plutonium plants because the plutonium plants, the plutonium processing plants, used to sit right on the Columbia River. And uh, people wow. have so many. Yes. Th this is an interesting thing. Most people don't know it, but the plutonium processing plants, I think there was three or four of them were right on the corner of the river. There was so much uproar that they actually had to move. That's why they moved it inland so that nobody would see it anymore because people were getting sick. Uh, Chuck Johnson from Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility has an excellent presentation that he discusses this very issue. You know that the government still will not let me sue them? I have tried and tried and tried to sue them, and they said there was no releases of any radiation during my time spot, and that's just a lie. It is a lie. And so um, I had been an anti-nuclear activist for a long time. Mm -hmm. In 1973, in college, 
I wrote a paper, and I termed the, the phrase global warming. Now, the phrase nuclear priesthood, I was the first person that I know of that used that against the nuclear industry. Um, now, I know that that phrase that? came when from we... that guy. Yeah, from uh, I said that in 1972. Yeah, well, that was now, the Now, Weinberg might have said it before this. me. Yeah. He well, might have said it before me, but I didn't know about it. that presentation. 72 was How the interesting. Yes. They've been using me a long time, Ronnie. <laughs> it might be. It might be that he got it from me and tried to make it a good thing. It's an evil thing. They think that they, are, and I know physics. I know more. I have forgotten more about radiation than most of these physicists know. I'm serious when I say that because I studied it after I found out I had cancer, like my life depended on it because I knew it did. I knew it did. And so, um, and I also saw it as the future of the world. Now, um, I got married. I miscarried 13 times. I couldn't hold a baby. I couldn't have, I would miscarry usually very, very early. And this is heartbreaking, Lonnie. I mean, I wanted children so much. I was a, a professional children's juggler. I came back after cancer, taught myself to juggle. They'd taken out my complete thyroid, so I'd lost this huge octave range voice. I'd lost this beautiful voice, and I could sing rock and roll, opera, you name it. And I was already writing stories. I was already writing children's stories. I was doing a lot of art. And all of a sudden, my life was tragically taken from me with this cancer. I mean, I was devastated. So I came back, and I wrote 27 workable juggling shows which is a huge amount of work, but most people don't have anywhere near that amount of work. And I knew that. So that's what I wanted. I wanted to be a writer. I was always going to have, you know, the great American novel. I was always going to sell a lot of, you know. I always had these dreams, right? We all do. Mine were smashed, and I mean they were smashed physically. I was pursued and smashed. So I kept miscarrying it, and it looked like I was never going to have a baby, you know, and all of a sudden, I had a baby, the cancer returned, and I was again in the fight of my life. Nobody believed I would live, Lonnie. Nobody believed it. I lived, but I lost my husband. He walked out. Well, that happens, you know. Too bad he couldn't handle cancer. He didn't want a baby. Fine. You know, you knew all these years I've been married to, 18 years, you knew I was working on it. So out the door, you know, I wasn't even worried about it. I had cancer to deal with and a baby. And this is the only time I've had any happiness in my adult life was with my family. And my child just meant so much to me. I was so happy. Well, uh, my ex kept telling me he wasn't running around, but he'd come home and he broke my arm, he broke my back. And at that point, I said, that's it. I will not put up with violence. That's it. I'm filing for divorce. And um, he said, okay, I agree with you. I've been rotten to you. And he met me out at the Malala River, which is outside of Portland. We go up there. We spend the day. But there's this white pickup that keeps watching me, Lonnie, all day long. It keeps watching me. And I'm looking at my ex going, you know, that ain't right. And um, my ex-husband, he looked at me in the eye and he goes, you know, we, we figured it all out. I'm going to pay you so much alimony and child support. You can have the kid. Uh, I'll take the juggling stuff up to the park. You just sit here. I want you and Billy to be together. Remember that I said that. That's what he said, word for word. And I'll walk up to the car. I started up to the car. The white pickup who had been watching me all afternoon moves. Rolls down the window. He looks at me and he smiles. And this is what he says to me, Lonnie. Are you still there? Yeah, yeah, I'm just listening. Lonnie, I just want to make sure I'm, yeah, I still got you. I'm still on. No, don't worry. He we looks know. at me in the eye. He smiles ear to ear. And he says, I love you. I'm sorry. You're going to die. Phrase I was to hear later, and I'll tell you about that phrase and, and how that phrase has haunted me. Picked up the biggest gun I've ever seen in my life, an automatic rifle, and opens up on me. Now, I had just climbed up to the top of this cliff up above the river, and my ex-husband is parked over by him, and I thought, oh, my God, if I run to my ex-husband, I'll be shot. I've got to protect the baby. So what I did is I curled myself into a ball, and I literally flew off the side of the cliff. It was a death move. I mean, I knew I couldn't survive the fall. But somehow, you know, remember the fall when I was I was uh, and in the third grade? Remember yeah. I lived? <laughs> yeah, I lived, Ronnie. And the kid wasn't not from me. He didn't have a scratch on him, but I was beat to heck. 
Uh, my cheek was broken. My nose was broken. I mean, wow. I was there was blood everywhere. What year was this? I mean, no. no. Uh, this year was 1991. My my baby was two years old. So you have and been so, going through this since how long? I'm like, it sounds like yeah, this has been like a 20, yeah. 30 year journey of being right. uh, of so, hell on earth. Now, when I testified against Teladom Chang, and this year is like 1982, this, this is 10 years is before question. I was shot at. You mentioned this, that you had testified. This is what blew me away. This company, folks, is in right. Albany, Oregon. It's called ATI right, right now. And they, right. what they do is they specialize, according to their website, specialty alloys and components. And the reactive and fract refractory metal producer has been making zirconium mill products. They specialize, including half hafnium, niobium, T right, right. Helium, titanium, vaconium, and They're many a heavy other. metals factory. It, it right They're here. Heavy metal. It's thirty miles from where I live, right? Right. And that's now. To I why have we found have a out. Cancer cluster up there. That's right. Salem, Monmouth, Independence, that whole area, Albany, Corvallis. The factory is actually, I think it's called Millsburg. It's right uh, north of the actual Albany town. And um, it, it, uh, when I testified against them, when I found out they had what we called in the day dime, dime is depleted uranium. And uh, long before depleted uranium was called depleted uranium, they changed the name. And this is what they do, Lonnie. They change the name of things. Uh, they change the name of cell field. Uh, they change the name of things to confuse people. Uh, how we measure radiation, they change that all the time. Curies, rads, you know. Uh, and it makes it confusing for people, and you have to do their whole little translation thing to understand what they're talking about. But I knew what depleted uranium was. I knew it was, was uh, toxified uranium that had went through uh, a, a uranium reactor. And what that means is that after that, the uranium is excited. It means that the uh, uh, structure of the atom itself is fighting now to get out. And it's a deadly poison. It's a deadly toxin to human beings. And so when I went in, I had cancer. Uh, my cancer returned in the early 80s. And I walked in there with my hair in a neat little bun and a beautiful little three-piece black suit on and my little high heels, my makeup, and I'd stuff myself with, and I vomit medicine and, and uh, uh, codeine and everything else I could get my hands on just to stand up. Well, I got international news coverage that day. And what happened is after I had finished the speech, there was a man who had sat there and smirked at me. And the whole room thought that I was uh, pro-nuke. And everybody that was anti-nuke were kind of in flannel shirts and Birkenstocks and jeans and then they started to whisper, that's Bobby Galileo. That's, she's one of us. And they had all pledged me their minutes. So I got to do my whole speech, you know, and it made international news coverage. And those farmers had no idea. This is what Teladon Wacheng was planning to do. They were planning to take the contaminated earth from their, their uh, cooling pools, from all their pools where they had stored all this depleted uranium and let the water evaporate off of it, and put it on farmers' fields. It would have killed the farmers, it would have killed their families, and anybody who ate that food would have died. And even the company, I'm sure, did not know. This is a PR idea. This is a PR idea, Lonnie. The, even the scientists who worked in this company didn't know that's what they were going to do. And they were furious. I finish the speech, I get a standing round of, of applause, farmers come up, hug me, what happened was just because of that one speech, before that, before that day, Teladon Wacheng uh, said they had no depleted uranium on their site, none. I proved that they had 500,000 tons of depleted uranium on that site. Now, we know the 90% rule, it might have been 5 million tons of depleted uranium on that site. We don't even know what they had on that site. Their oven to this day sits on that site where they were processing depleted uranium. And so, and their pools, you could see them from I-5. They had to move all their pools because you could see them driving up and down the freeway. 
because I made that speech, that site was turned into a special fund site. That's the power that we have when we speak out. After I finished the speech, you know, everybody's hugging me, everybody's celebrating, everybody's Where happy. Where was the speech again? Tell us again exactly. It was in Millsburg. It was in Albany, Oregon. Millsburg, up here I in turned around. Right. The guy who had been staring at me during the whole speech and smirking looked at me and he goes, you're going to die. Do you have a family? Wow. you want them to live? And I, nobody had ever threatened my life before. I'm a children's juggler, you know. I'm going, What? And from that day to this day, my life has been a holy hell on earth. Well, you know, Hope, as I you were talking, I actually was looking up this ATI. The company's called ATI. This is it, There was a little link on their website that says uh, the company's uh, efforts to announce its actions to improve future financial performances. This made my hair raise. Allegheny oh, Technology yeah. Incorporated today announced several actions to improve the company's future financial performance, which include indefinite idling of the Raleigh, Utah titanium sponge production facility and consolidating certain titanium manufacturing operations in Albany, Oregon. Right, right. So Oregon um, thinks it's a non-nuclear state, but it is not. It is not a non-nuclear state. It has the only heavy metals factory outside <clears throat> sexual intercourse, uh, nobody, <laughs> Siberia. <laughs> Excuse my French, if you know what I mean. It has the only heavy metal plant in the world out of um, bum Fukushima, Siberia, really. Wow. And um, that's how dangerous that plant is. What they were doing with dime plutonium to this day, I don't know. The plant was full. The earth was full of americenium and curium. Uh, so this is really deadly, deadly toxins. And um, that's why I spoke out. Well, now fast forward to the guy shooting me with the M16. I get to the bottom of the cliff. There's blood everywhere. I, I had curled myself around my baby boy. He was unscathed, thank God, thank you, Lord, you know. And I, I remember what my dad said, who had been a sergeant in World War II, and he'd fought the Japanese in the Pacific War, and he was one of the first responders to go into Nagasaki after they dropped the bomb. He literally went in there, he got radiation sickness, and he helped thousands of Japanese people. He said, my war was against the Japanese Imperial Army, not against women and children. Wow. And it changed his whole way of thinking about the Japanese and who they were. But at, at any rate, so I remember what Sergeant always told me. If anybody's shooting at you, run like a rabbit, zigzag. And so I was zigzagging. They got out of their car on top of this cliff and were still shooting at me. Down in the lowlands by the river, right, they're still shooting at me. And I'm dodging from rock to rock. And there's blood everywhere. And um, these bullets are huge. He put over a hundred rounds off after me. I get to a place, and there's a rock overhang that I had scouted out earlier when I'd, I'd been there all day. So I put my my baby underneath this rock shelter, and I curled up. And I thought, okay, this is what I'm going to do. They're going to come after me. I'm going to take them out. I'm going to get rocks. I'm going to throw them at them. <laughs> okay, it's all I've got. But I'm not going to go down without a fight. You know, I'm going to get these people. So I'm, I'm just shaking, and I'm waiting for him, and I can hear him talking up above. And, you know, I'm listening as intently as I can, and the guy's going, well, I'm sure we shot her. I'm sure she's dead now. Well, she's going to bleed out, and I can hear them laughing up there. And then I smell cigarette smoke, and I realize they're having a cigarette. And they're all laughing, and I can't figure out who it is talking, you know, and then they take off. I hear a car go, door slam, and they take off. I grab my baby, run up the cliff, think, oh, my God, my God, my ex-husband, he's up there, he's bleeding, he's bleeding to death. I'm going to throw him in the car, I'll get him to the hospital. My ex-husband never allowed me to drive, never. And so, you know, I'm running as fast as I can up this hill going, well, he's going to allow me today, you know, he's going to be shot full of Swiss cheese bullets, you know. I get up there, he's standing there smoking a cigarette, he's fine. And he looked at me like he'd seen a ghost, Lonnie. 
he looked at me and said, you're alive. He goes, you can't be alive. You can't survive that, that, that fall. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. I- I'm all right. I'm all right. <laughs> look, look, the baby's fine. There's not a, not a scratch on the baby. Isn't that great? And he's going, it's amazing. It's a miracle. So he throws me in the car and he goes, I'm going to go get him. They just shot at my wife and kid. I'm going to go get him. I look at this guy and I'm going, hello, this guy has an elephant gun. I have juggling clubs. I don't want to catch him. I want to go call the sheriff. He's looking at me and Lonnie, he goes, oh, there won't be any need for the sheriff. And he goes, yeah, they shot at you with an M16. Well, I don't know an M16 from an AK-47 from my broomstick. Do you think he knew about them? Well, let me finish. I never believed he was. I loved this man so totally. I was more than happy he was getting a divorce. I, I never wanted him around me again, but I loved him. This is the love of my life. This is my man, you know. I mean, usual. my God, yeah, you know. Yeah, oh, I was so stupid, Ronnie. Well, that's Ooh. the gaslighting. So, that's the gaslighting thing that we're all trained to do, just be part of that. So. Right, right. It's double think. And so we get to the service station, and that's how, how strong it is. And we never believe what's right even in front of us until we have to. And I'll, I'll go into that, of why I had to believe it. Um, we go into a gas station, and I get out of the car. My ex runs around. He throws me against the car, and he goes, you aren't calling anybody. Well, a couple of farmers were watching this going, hey, you are bleeding everywhere. Did he do this to you? I'm going, no, no. I, I, a man shot at me with a big gun, and I jumped off a cliff. And they're going, you need to go call the sheriff. There's women inside the store. I'll help you. My ex-husband, they're, they're looking at him going, you touch her again. You'll have us to answer to. And this farmer and his kid stood there in front of me and said, you're not going to touch her. And thank God for them, Lonnie. I got into the store, called the, the Clackamas uh, County Sheriff. They come up and they meet me. The sheriff immediately thought my ex-husband was involved. And I said, oh, he couldn't be. Even if he wants me dead as his ex-wife so he won't have to pay out the money in child support, he wouldn't hurt his baby. And the guy looks at me and he goes... killing everybody. Are you kidding? He goes, he looks at me really sorry, Phil, and he goes, I hope you're right. And so um, I'm terrified, to tell you the truth. Really terrified that day. Well, you know... Because... Hope. A threat to your baby is totally different than a threat to you. I... I'll take on anybody. I'll break their kneecaps. But when it's your baby, you deal on a totally different level, Lonnie. I mean, it's a totally different instinctual drive. And um, so all of a sudden, I've got my divorce. I've got a house. I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life. Uh, people start stalking me. I'm raped publicly. Uh, I'm terrorized. Do uh, you think that all came and, from your testimony against ATI? I think that they're interrelated. I think that you cannot separate out. Once they violated my privacy, once they found out what I had written, children's stories, songs worth billions of dollars, there was so much money to be made in illegal surveillance that for the first time, they were using an artist, didn't have to pay them. I couldn't prove what was happening, that that it became very interconnected. Money, these people are killing us with nuclear energy. They know it's deadly. They know it's toxic. They don't care. And they didn't care that I was had cancer and was starving and dying. They you know, didn't honestly, care how it hard I worked. It's intentional. That's my thing. This is why I say in my intro, which you didn't hear, but you have heard it on the radio show, is right, that I we sure are have. we are assets on a balance sheet, and I really think that they have this. It's interesting because I haven't gotten back to it in a couple of days, but on my YouTube channel, I'm reading a story that is about uh, some some uh, sociologists in Spain basically tested the safety culture model of the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is widely used around the world and in every nuclear mm-hmm. facility there is. Right. Right. Do you know what they showed? They tested this. The IAEA has a safety culture model that says it covers five areas of safety. 
the first thing that, that really blew me away that made me decide to start reading this on my YouTube channel was that it unequivocally has shown, their studies proved that it had never been empirically tested. It had never, right. they had right. never right. tested it. So we have a safety culture making these assumptions that's never been tested. And they did it's actually done get done. some nuclear, they did get nuclear workers to raid it and in, in Spain at a nuclear facility there where they were able to use this questionnaire and use the model and see if the safety culture actually worked in the five areas yeah. that it said it did. Their study said yeah. unequivocally that at best, at best it could handle one area of safety, but all the other ones, it could not even halfway prove it. So the nuclear industry is lying to its own people, its own industry. It's making a bunch of lies up and convincing scientists and right. physicists and they're doing it for a money lie that because is a complete lie. Ronnie, they're making so much money off this industry. They made you so bet. much money off violation of my privacy. Ronnie, when you're making money, Inc., you start lying they have about the harm you're doing. A revenues. ATI has revenues as of June 30th, 2016, for a, for the 12th month period ending June 30th, 3.1 billion with a B folks, billion dollars, and what do they make, right. titanium, zirconium, you should look at their list, and to be there honest, there you go, I yep, that's alone. exactly the truth, titanium, right, right. nickel, and cobalt, so, I mean, I am beyond my zirconium, my mouth is, this is right, mm -hmm. if you think your little neck of the woods is free of the harm for the nuclear industry, dig deeper, folks, because this I have to say... This is happening everywhere. And, Lonnie, to get back to my story, I had corroboration over this shooting. Two little boys, you know how Oregon is, kids go out on their bicycles, everybody goes to the river on sunny days, had been on the other side of the river. And they had been watching me because I'm Bobby Galileo. They'd seen my street show. And they were big fans. So they went, yeah, that's Bobby. She's going to juggle. Let's just sit here and wait. Sure enough, I juggled. And so they were, you know, that age where you just love juggling, where juggling is the most miraculous thing in the world. I and so they had sat way, down actually. on the cliff on the other side of the river. Right, right. And some of us never outgrow it. <laughs> and so they had watched the whole thing. And they had seen the guy shoot at me. And they had raced on their bicycles into the store to tell the people I had, I was dead, that I'd been shot. Because, and they had bullets in their hand. Wow. The bullets from this guy's gun had went all the way across the river and lodged in the opposite side of the river. And they wow. had picked up the bullets. And the cop looked at these bullets and he goes, they're M16. And I thought, gosh, Grant, no, excuse me, my ex-husband, knows a whole lot about guns. <laughs> Who knew? <Wow. laughs> yeah. And so anyway... Come to find out, the police never arrested these guys. They said it was an accidental shooting. They never even gave them a ticket for putting off firearms in public. I was shot at again in my house. Uh, uh, and again and again, these horrible things keep happening to me. Acts of violence, terrorism, stalking, gaslighting. Things are coming to a crisis. Um, my ex-husband threatens me and my kid. He took my kid, I, I, I took my kid and I ran. At, at some point, you've got to understand, I'm going to die if I don't do something. I'm really being threatened. People were making millions of dollars off me. They didn't care how I was suffering, Lonnie. They didn't care. They were making money. And now they do care because it's their children, Lonnie, because it's their future, because well, they're actually, not making any money anymore. Care. Let me tell you the truth. I don't think cancer, it's that. I think their own self-interest now is threatened. Well, That's cancer the truth, is Lonnie. the number one killer of children, brain cancer. And they are still... Do you know, at the Go turn ahead. of the century, according to my research, only one out of 100 people had cancer? That's right. Now, according to the nuclear industry, it is 40%. The number one killer of children used to be accidental death and then influenza and then smallpox. Now it is cancer, cancer, cancer. 
That's right. It's it's brain cancer. It's uh, uh, leukemia, blood, blood cancer, you know how simple uh, and bone cancer. Epidemiologically, this is how simple it is, and I'm not even a scientific type. When I first got involved in this, when I first met Kevin Blanche and Kevin had cancer, I actually pulled up a map of the cancer clusters, I put a little thing of where's the highest thing for cancer. And you right. can literally overlay a map of the cancer clusters and locate nuclear facilities. That's how yes, simple it yes, does you not can. it does not take brain science. And yet this morning in this morning's newspaper, the Hill dot com, a big influential Washington D C article said we, in order for us to save the planet, we need to rely on nuclear. And it was written by an administrator, an assistant administrator of the EPA. Those people are evil, and they have no regard for human life, while the people of St. Louis and all across this country are dying of nuclear pollution. The EPA digs in its heels. Now, and let me say something real quick, nuclear. Ronnie. Ronnie, kudos to you, baby because you are the one person that is speaking out against St. Louis. And a lot of those children are going to die. They They're going to die. Not. Horrible, That's what made me painful, attention. awful deaths. And nobody is speaking out. And nobody is saying anything. And people are going to die in St. Louis. And when you told me Dr. Helen Caldicott said the place should be abandoned, she is a very careful scientist. She is very cautious in her words. That she means to me that a whole lot of St. Louis needs to be evacuated. She actually got... She I mean, was furious. She gave a presentation, and frankly, it scared the people who brought her. She gave a presentation, and, uh, you know, the things she said, you know, Dr. Caldicott, she's very frank. She just says what she believes. She doesn't mince words. And she basically told these people, these people within, you know, five miles, they need to immediately need to be evacuated. Like, there is no... You got it. Hands down, the government should be evacuating these people as if there was a... 15, 20 foot flood because their lives are just as much in danger. And yet, there, that old plutonium, that breathe. old uranium is going to catch fire. And Lonnie, one of the things that we have to be cautious of, and, and this is so true, is that the nuclear paradigm, the nuclear industrial machine, it discredits people, it hurts people, it divides people. And the anti nuke movement must unite. Excuse me, the nuclear truth movement must unite. We must become arm in arm together because this is the truth. These people have no social conscience. The thing is it's it's changing, Lonnie, because people within the movement, people now now let me explain to me. Yeah, let me go back to my story real quick. Um, all this happens to me, these horrible things, I go after my son because in one day I had thirty death threats against my son. Um, I was terrified for my child's life. Absolutely out of my mind. Um, my ex has him. They've hidden him from me. I don't know where he is. I finally find out where his girlfriend lives, and I found out he'd been with this woman for years and years, long when he was lying to me, clear back in 1991, and this is like 1997. He'd been lying to me. And so I find out their place, and it's outside of Portland, on the east of Portland. I go up this road, and there's the truck. There's the truck that shot at me that day. They lived right adjacent to her property. And I knew it was the truck because on my hard drive was the license plate number. And I looked at that. I got out of my car and looked at it and went, oh, my God. These are the people that shot at me that day with the M16. Wow. He had a brand-new truck and a brand-new M16 bought with cash that nobody knew how he got the week that he fired on me. That second in time frees everything because I'm going after my kid now. I don't care what the government says. I don't care what anybody says. I'm going after my child. Because when I saw that truck, for the first time I knew this was planned. And uh, I, I was in absolute terror. I, was, uh, I went to an architect. I didn't know he was a good friend of my ex-husband. Uh, I told him, what should I do? Do I go to the police with this information? Uh, do I get a lawyer? What should I do? He had no advice, and he acted very angry at me. I didn't know he was affiliated with my ex-husband. I didn't know they were friends. Later that night, I'm blown sky high in my car. I'm outside of Gresham, Oregon. My car is blown up. I do three twirls. It somersaults three times around and crashes down. I'm, I have a compound concussion. I'm thrown from the car. 
And, you know, those kill people, Lonnie. I mean, thank God I survived. I knock on the door of this house. Nobody's there. Nobody's there. So and then I, I walk away, but I realize I'm bleeding out. I'm going to die if I don't get some help somehow. I see a light go in in the house. I go back. The people play possum, and, and I never broke into this house. I never did anything wrong. I'm knocking on the door, begging them to help me. I can't find their phone. Their door is wide open. They opened it for me. They got up out of bed and opened the door. So I said, okay, I'll give you 80 bucks, and I'll borrow your car for one night. I've got to go get my son. I've got to make the authorities aware. My kid is really in danger now. And so um, uh, what happens, to make a long story short, is I'm arrested. I was put to death three times. I spent two and a half years behind bars, was never given a lawyer. In two and a half years, I never saw a lawyer. They said I was crazy, Lonnie, because they said there's no such thing as violation of privacy. There's, it's a lie. Okay, that's a lie. And what they did to me was they knew I was allergic to those drugs. They knew it. They gave them to me. They never diagnosed me with a mental illness. I don't have one. And they put me to death. They stopped my heart three times. They gave me five strokes. So if you don't think that this is about money, this is about huge amounts of money, and that's why, Lonnie, I say, you pay me the money. It's the only way I could protect me and my children to this day. My brother in Alaska who helped me, I, I wrote a very well-known, best-selling novel in his attic. Um, he was a Vietnam veteran. His leg was amputated uh, last year, a uh, year before last. They cut off the wrong leg, Lonnie. They, did, they left on his bad leg, and they cut off his good one. Two weeks later, they try to burn him alive in his house. They steal his gun collection, and then they beat him to death. There's so a long arm. Let me ask arm. you this, Hope. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Who do you think? I, I mean, miss my brother. These are these are pretty, some very serious. I, I'm, I, you know, actions, and I won't even call them allegations because they actually happen to you, right? But this is right, the question. Right. At at what level? Obviously, this takes government like there's a lot of police officers and a lot of police departments who have to look away at this type of thing you bet Correct? they do and some of them are dirty and some of them have been involved but a lot of them aren't dirty a lot of them are really good people and they have looked away Lonnie they have taken their paychecks they have went to work and they have allowed me to be tortured to be bully ragged Every day I'm exposed to repetitive tape loops, and I stand up and I say that to anybody in this country. There are people doing surveillance every day, every day, sometimes hundreds of times a day. My life is threatened. We love you. You're, we're sorry. You're going to die. You're going to die. The same words from a prostitute who, when I was uh, arrested, she was the happiest person you ever met. This person was so happy she couldn't stop smiling. She tortured her son to death. She had a wall-sized picture of her kid. She'd look at this, this picture of her child that she tortured to death and go, I love you. I'm sorry. You're going to die. And that's a phrase that that they've been using like on me all these years. That sounds like an effort just to drive you insane. That's kind of a... You, you bet. Know, you bet. And I'll tell you why. That's a super gaslighting technique to just sort of make sure that you're, you're doubting yourself. They had yourself. a whole lot of money invested in this, Lonnie, because they were using me for money. They have an unpaid bank machine. They have a creative artist. Every day I write between two and three songs. They don't have it anymore, but I'm still writing them. <coughs> every day, Lonnie, every day I, I do new work on my children's stories, on my fantasy stories, but they don't have them. But the work they created from this, Game of Thrones, Da Vinci Crap, Harry Potty, we're talking massive amounts of money. And they didn't like me anyway. I'd helped started one of the first rape crisis lines on the West Coast with Norma Wydance and Sam Morgan. And um, so I've always had this incredible self-identified feminist. I, I wouldn't be a prostitute no matter how they beat me, how they tortured me. You I wouldn't what? do anything oh, unethical. You keep mentioning Oregon. And they try to get these kids into drugs and prostitution, Lonnie. That's what they're trying to do. I have to say you they keep They want people Oregon. they can control. Right. I think Oregon is the worst in the world. I'm still, to this day, fighting extradition to Oregon. Oregon is taking all the crap from Hanford. Oregon has Teledon Wache. 
Oregon is one of the dirtiest states, governmental wise, that ever existed in the. In, we have the most cool people on earth in Oregon. Our conservatives love freedom and want human liberties. Our, our liberal people are beautiful. They're incredible. <laughs> Oregon has a dirty government because they are the ones that are dying and have been dying for the last 30 years from Hanford. And it is sick, Lonnie. And only now do people are aware enough to even talk about the issues I brought up. Um, last night, my life was threatened, you know, right outside my house. This is years and years later. Just last and I've night, still never mean? done anything wrong. What, what, just last night, yes. By some people using a small child. These people are evil, Lonnie. They are evil, and they don't want me to talk about it. <coughs> well, Lonnie, you know, the other thing that, me up. that seems to happen here, Hope, is that while you're explaining these stories, to be honest, they sound so wild. This is, you know, we're considered conspiracy theorists, and these are considered like wild-eyed allegations because none of it is, a lot of it is unprovable. And so this you is know, the... You know, I know one thing. I have a police report for that shooting that day on the Moala River. Wow. And this is the reality. I have a police report for them shooting at me and my son on my street on 355 uh, Morrison Street in Portland, Oregon. They shot into my house with a 9 millimeter automatic weapon. Ronnie, a lot of it is provable. <laughs> my car was blown up that night. The state of Oregon never, ever, one time, gave me any pain relievers or helped me at all with that concussion. They were waiting for me to die, Lonnie. They were waiting for me to die from the effects of a compound concussion. And I didn't die. And, and Lonnie, a lot of this is provable. And a lot of it isn't. How they gaslight. I mean, these people are pros. They use crisis actors. They are very cautious. They, well, not they only that, now they have the technology to sort of implant emotions and seeds in your brain if they want to. I mean, they've gotten they really... They try. They try. I mean, it's true. They do try, and they prey on the weak. But this is the issue. Is like this whole thing is about just uh, denial, denial, denial. It's it's inconscionable. Right. I mean, I, I, I just can't even and believe... It's like killing our crap. economy. We're not buying it. The American people are waking up. Even the most stay-at-home, quiet person on earth that wants to believe everything about America has got to listen to the story and say, my God, if she's really a juggler, she must be telling the truth about something. I have never juggled in the last 16 years and not been harassed. I have never done anything. I mean, they kept me awake for, for nights on end at one point. They have been worse than they are now. Let, let me tell you, when you're being shot at, when you're being beat, this is not a game. And I was used to control, I think, media. And that's why I have to have the truth. That's why I'm so proud of you, Lonnie, for this interview. Because the Internet has got to tell the truth. We cannot go the same route as Lamestream did with this big lie. Using me is, is key. Stopping the use, the abuse, the violation of me. The way they are violating me electronically to use me, to exploit me, is the same way that radiation is violating everybody right now on the West Coast. And let me tell you something, Lonnie, it isn't just the West Coast. I have done research, and I think New York has hit just as hard as, as Seattle is. I really do. And I think that the southern states, Houston and Florida, are hit worse. Um, because of how the jet stream, the southern jet stream, has taken so much radiation from Fukushima right across the south. I think we're going to see the highest death rate and casualty rate in, in L.A. I really believe that. And um, I can tell you this. People, I I, just yesterday I talked to a woman from L.A. Uh, who called me up for work, and she had just went through cancer treatment. I mean, an unknown. Uh -huh. She was... Uh, I think she told me she was 38 years old, and they were just confounded as to why why did she get cancer? And I'm like, uh, right. you're living. She's you're living right. She lives right below San Francisco. And I said, look, you're being bombarded. Oh, no. You're right on the coast. But people, right. she's like, well, what are we going to do? And I said, you know, this is reality. I really can't tell you what to do. I do know that you can protect yourself through 
nutrition, health, good attitude, and get active. Like, you need to shut down Diablo Canyon. You live right there. You need to get actively right. engaged in protecting, stopping them from dumping the nuclear waste right into the ocean, right off of the Pacific Ocean, which Diablo Canyon regularly does. They all do. It's, it's unco- none of us, this is the hard part for me, Hope, is as I've been doing this radio show in depth, just talking to people, like, it's like unpeeling an onion, and honestly, we are being maliciously layer attacked. Layer after layer after layer of their cruelty, their cover-up, their pollution. Um, Ronnie, why I am targeted, why I was targeted so hard, now, barring a car is nothing. I should never have been arrested. I shouldn't have even spent the night in jail. I left the people money. I told them who I was. I left everything in black and white on paper, signed my name to it, gave my address, my Social Security number, my phone number. You know, this is not a car thief. This is, I stole nothing. I break into nothing. It's a lie, Lonnie. And they blew me up that night in my car. And yet still, I wouldn't violate another human being on this planet. We do not violate people, Lonnie. That's your bottom line. I am begging all the children that are out there playing the game, don't you shoot each other. No more school shootings. Don't hurt anybody. Don't. We can never solve this with violence. We are a peaceful, angry people. We are fighting for life right now on this planet. And our kids are confused. They see me, who they know is good, who they know never did anything wrong, be treated horribly worse than dirt. And they go, well, heck, maybe we should just go out and just do a bunch of drugs and war form or whatever. No, no. And there's no such thing as sex in jail. Never. There's rape in jail. That's all jail's about. It's rape. And, and we have got to clean up our act. We have got to clean up the prison system. We have got to clean up what's going on. We, nobody, no corporation has a right to pull a gaslight on a person. No show has a right. No sitcom. That's all they no, do no in the United, that's the United States business model is gaslighting. That well, is... we have to stop it right now because if we're not genuine, if we don't speak our truth from our heart, you know, I'm part Native American. We believe if you talk with a forked tongue that we have a right to split that tongue. And where it stopped, where it turned around, they were, they were ganging up on me doing terrible acts of injustice to me, and this was in Tucson, and I'd just come up with renewable energy. My work four years before Fukushima was on how to contain meltdowns because I knew that there were areas that nobody had ever looked into. Why aren't big corporations being funded for this? Why isn't NASA working on this? Why isn't people being funded? I'll tell you why. The nuclear industry never wanted people to know how prevalent this is, how you're either going to shut a nuke plant down or it's going to melt down. Those are your two options, melt down or shut down. And we have no way to safely contain the waste. We never are going to. They also this don't have any real toxic plan. for all time. They also and don't have the, a way to safely shut down nuclear power plants. They really don't. Do you know that the Department really of don't. Energy, the Department of Energy has owned less than five thousand dollars in its budget to shut down a non-emergency nuclear power plant? I was dumbfounded. That's ridiculous. Uh, it's That's constant in their budget. Look at their budget. I pulled up their budget about two years ago, and it's something oh. I've done every year. It's a constant in their budget, and the way they fund for nuclear, you know, the budget of the United States is complicated intentionally so that people can't really track it. I spent a week tracking all the funding sources for nuclear that affect our daily lives outside of the military because the military is really why we have nuclear. But So I thought, okay, we can't really deal with that. But the Department of Energy, who is responsible for overseeing all these nuclear power plants, they have, they don't even consider shutting down nuclear. This is why Indian Point, they will not shut I know, Indian I Point know. down. So until Indian Point goes where there are 50 million, million people. people in New York dead. That's when right. they're going to shut right. it. And if then, then they won't even do it then. They'll just say this was a, if this was something beyond their circumstances. Nobody ever saw it coming. The same bullshit they told us in Fukushima. No, and right but, now, but in you Fukushima, know they're wrong. just allowing it to get worse and worse and worse. And then they're going to say, for five years, the world, the world changed.
changed on 311. The entire world changed that day. And yet they are still harassing me, still hounding me, still doing hate crimes to me five and a half years later who has renewable, perpetual, safe, green energy. And, Lonnie, I can say that because I really do have it. And because I think what's going to protect me is when the truth comes out, and you're helping that right now, is I will have enough money to protect me and my children. I do not want my kids used by these people. My private life is my private life. Nobody has a right to one second of it. And um, I've been celibate for 20 years. Well, I'm a very spiritual person. It's been really ha- healthy and happy for me. But anybody else would either be forced to be sexual in front of these people or be used and degraded and raped in front of them. And it is wrong, Lonnie. That our whole thing, I can't even pray alone. Every right that we have is being taken away from an industry that is stupid and fat and gluttonous and cruel and lying. And when you see, I went into hospitals. I did shows for children dying of cancer. You know that Dr. Banateski, the incredible Russian uh, scientist and doctor, he discovered Chernobyl heart, that cesium was actually killing children all over Europe from attacking their heart muscles. This man is, to me, one of the greatest heroes that ever lived. Say he was in again. prison in Russia for seven years. Yes, I know that. And I you mean, know why they he, they sent him to uh, prison? This was interesting. Because he discovered that apple pectin seriously helped children with uh, radiation exposure. So as soon as his paper came out about oh the apple God. pectin cure, he was thrown into jail. This was one of the very first stories that got me super aware of how evil the nuclear industry is. So, Hope, guess what? Think about oh, what they did to me. We have Working to end this. As we hard cannot as I continue. Could. Hope, we have uh, 30 seconds okay. left. I hope okay. you will come back and share more of our conversation because, really, people need to know about how deep the harm that the nuclear industry, not just the control These of the government, but anybody evil. who speaks out is a target. So That's this right. Been, you have and been I am less to, targeted the more I speak out. The okay, more we fight out, we the less seconds. targeted the safer. Hope we have 15 seconds. Um, You've been listening to uh, Bobby Galileo, Hope Caster, with Lonnie Clark on the Age of Fission radio show. Please put your courage feet on. Take action. It's not made up. It's real. It's up to us, folks. Thank you.